out. We want to talk about how to build your own application. Remember, if you're going to build a, an application that sits as a proxy between users and if you're going to consider doing this with security, it can be a little bit challenging. So you have to be a little bit aware that if you have an app in here or a portal that has a search box, right? So here's a search box. Application with a search box, you want to send uh, when you click, the user click, enters in a search term like maybe health, click on search. What's this going to send to the GSA? Did we look at that yet? Maybe not. Okay, search appliance. All it's, all it's doing is using an HTTP URL interface, meaning all you have to do is send it a GET request with a URL. And the URL string has all the parameters in it. So. Uh, Q is the query term. So here it'll be HTTP. Oops. Host. Then it'll be uh, the action will be search. We'll look at this in just a minute. Action will be search. Query term will be there. The number of results you want to get back will be in there. The sort order, whether it's date or relevance, will be in there. And that's what we'll look at when we're building an application. And then when you get the content back, what will that be? XML, yeah. This will be your results. Now, if you're going to set up security here so the users are coming in and using secure search in a portal, then your application is going to have to handle that sending credentials to the GSA through whatever protocol you're going to set up with authentication and handling the session. There will also be a cookie coming back here, a session cookie with the GSA. So your application will have to handle that cookie and then resubmit that for subsequent requests. How to build your own app. Specify the search input parameters and then process that XML coming back from the search appliance. So here's a Here's the diagram. You've got a search application or a portal, search button, sends a GET request with the URL and the search parameters, and then the XML results come back. It may be that it's actually helpful to receive, to apply the style sheet and get HTML back and then parse the HTML and rebuild a new, put that into a new page. Places where that might help is with like dynamic navigation because we build up the nice little HTML gadgets that show you the groups of, uh, groups of results. Here's an example of a website. It's uh, Christie's. They sell high-end stuff like wine and, I don't know, uh, other high-priced items to people. Uh, they've got nice, oh, you can't see the metadata filtering too well. You can't see the dynamic navigation result. Oh, here it is. Here's some dynamic navigation results. And they have additional controls on them. So they've got arrows that can collapse or expand the category. They have Another arrow here, you can enter in a search term and do more specific search on just the values in that metadata group. But what else have they done? They, you can tell this is obviously a, a hosted web application between the users and the GSA. Here's their search results. They've got an action item here. They've got prices listed. They may have even added additional metadata through the processing. Look at the sort. Uh, to sort by date, sale date, uh, if you want to display in a list or in a grid. So all these components they've built in their own application. Here they have collections, which we haven't seen yet with our, with our training yet. But they can search by all locations. This could be the source or the hosts, where the URL patterns of the documents, where they're coming from. Number of results per page. So if a user selects 30, um, then another search request has to be sent out the GSA with num parameter equal to 30, and it comes back and parses the results. Here's their dynamic navigation. Here's their navigation between pages. So if you want to go to the next set of results or the previous set of results, this was displayed in your search results in GSA at the very bottom of the page. And now that navigation was created automatically for you when the XSLT style sheet rendered from XML to HTML. Now if you're going to interrupt that XSLT processing, 
you may have to build these and determine that based on how many results came back. We're going to search for wine. Here's the results, and you can, this is really cool, you can slide this, here's the price bar that you can slide down and it'll regenerate the search. Looking for different range value on the price. Price is a metadata field in this case. So you can go to, let's see, they've changed their interface since I took the screenshot, so I'm going to have to, yeah, I'd have to look around a little bit. Filter by all locations, or here's other locations, Amsterdam. So content coming from an Amsterdam server. This might be metadata or this might be a collection, not sure. Sort by date, by relevance, right? So it's going to send a different sort parameter to the search appliance when you run the search. Oh, look, they got images added to their, their content as well. So here are some of the search parameters that get sent over during the initial query. They'll be in the URL string that you send to the GSA. Sort can be ascending or descending. Um, date can be uh, specify a specific date that you want. This would be after this certain date. Get fields will tell you which metadata fields you want returned in the XML. Required fields can be set up to perform your, fil your metadata filtering. So in this case, author is HR or author is US sales. And you'll have to URL encode this so that if you're going to use a space in between here, you get a percent %20 symbol entered in. This is a required field. This means that this has to be an exact match. Author has to equal exactly HR or author has to equal exactly US sales. Partial fields will search for this word in the metadata, and if it appears anywhere, it's like a keyword search, and it'll, it'll select that field then. It'll only look for complete words. This is an example, so uh, in this case, this partial fields match will match both of these meta tag fields. There's the search protocol reference, which is the most used documentation we have. I click on this link. It's going to take me, here we go, search protocol reference. And here's where you'll see all of, let's see here. If I go to the XML output, here's all the tags that get sent back. Okay. Cache. This is the XML coming back, and there's quite a few entries here. H, N, L, where's one we know? Um, we'll take a look at some of these. Where is one? Come on. Crawl date. Oh, there we go. So the data document was crawled. What's the cache URL inside the GSA? So when you, if the user clicks on the cache link, what do they go to? How can I get that document back? You can still get it back directly from the GSA. Um, here's the language of the document. It's in the lang parameter. Here's um, let's see, MT for metadata tag, meta tag. And we should see R for result here somewhere. Here we go, R for result, right? That's the beginning of a result. Estimated versus actual results. This is Another parameter that gets sent over, the num parameter. This tells us how many results do we want to see in this page. 10, 15, 50, 100. And where do we start? Now the start parameter gets automatically sent. When you're using the GSA, the start parameter will automatically get set for you. So let's take a look at this. Uh, what's general here? The. <laughs> I'm going for a lot of results here at this point. So I'm just entering in the as the search term. How many did I get? Well, 1 to 10 of about 297. What is my, the, the search appliance ran the search, and the GSA recognized that this was the first time you ran a search request for that search term. So let's look for the num and the, and the start parameters up in the top of the URL. 
I wanted to see the, the first set of num and, um, and start that got sent. It looks like it's just using default values. So start of 10 and, uh, sorry, start, start of 1 or 0. I can never remember if it's 1 or 0. And num of 10, so 10 results. Now if we click on next, like he was suggesting here, let's see what we get for start. Here's start. So start at number 10 in terms of results. So it was zero based. So the very first one by default set start parameter value of zero. This one set it to, to starting at the 10th result. If you're going to build your own application and you build this interface for next and previous, you're going to have to make just behind those links, you just have to set those parameters. The language, if you want to filter for language on the document, there's a parameter that gets sent over by default it's going to be lang equals uh, lr equals lang underscore en and it'll show each of the two character uh, codes for the various languages. ES for Spanish, JP I think for Japanese, I'm not 100% sure what some of those are. And you can also run uh, boolean not expressions on it. So Here's the not, which would be a dash in front of it. You can also use an or expression that says that I want to get documents in English or French. Language detection, we mentioned on day one yesterday, um, it's, it can be done on a web-based uh, basis based on the content on that page. So when a web server gets the content, which language is predominant, the search engine will check and then it will set the language. Uh, if there's insufficient content, we'll use the content language header in HTTP response from the web server, if that's available. Uh, we'll also set check character encoding specified in the content type header of the HTTP equiv meta tag in an HTML document. This will override the language detection. Some documents that have HTTP headers specify the last web page is encoded as GB2312 will be recognized as simplified Chinese. So that's just a note there that um, there's also some Chinese and Japanese and Korean HTML documents that are encoded in UTF-8 and it may not uh, recognize those languages correctly. So uh, the, the solution is there. Convert the documents to a different character encoding. Um, use GB2312 for simplified Chinese, Big 5 for traditional Chinese, and shift gist for Japanese. Now there may be automatic filtering. We've seen some of this when we ran searches. Notice that we have one type of filtering here. I didn't discuss this. This is called directory crowding. In internet-based search, it's not very common that you see documents coming from the same host on the same path uh, and the same directory. But in intranet search, it's going to be very common for users to get a lot of results from this directory. If we, if we uh, displayed all these documents down here, it would crowd out all these other results that are also relevant from other directories. So what we did was we found that users like this kind of interface where they tab and den over. We say, here are the two most relevant results from that directory. And for more, you can get this additional, you can click this additional, uh, this link here to get the rest of them. Now, when filtering occurs, the, there's going to be a tag in the XML that gets set. It's called the FI tag. And if, if it's present, that means that there was filtering. So if you're building your application, you should display some kind of a link like this. All right, so you look in the XML for the FI tag. If it's there, you'll display this. Now, how do we indicate whether we want to turn this on or off in the first place? Now, uh, by default, filtering is going to be turned on for directory crowding. Let's do this. Let me, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to put the filter in there myself. Filter equals zero. That should turn it off and I get my search result. There's another type of filtering that also occurs. Filter, if it's equal to zero, it will turn off both types of filtering. One of them is for directory crowding, another is for identical snippets. So if you see a snippet, in a search result and the GSA finds another result with an identical snippet, it assumes those are identical documents. So even though the URLs may point to different documents, so it will crowd those out. If you want to see results for them, you turn on 
uh, set the filter to 1, it will enable both. Set it to S, will uh, disable the snippet filtering. And if you set it to P, it'll disable the directory crowding. Here's the XML responses that come back. So we've talked about the parameters that we sent over. Now let's talk about some of the XML that comes back. The very first listing you're going to see is the query terms that were sent over in your URL. This is really valuable, especially if you're going to send over your own custom parameter okay, for processing. So let's say you want to add, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the next thing we get is the estimated number of results, M. So look in the M tag to see how many results you, you're expecting to get. Um, I'll run my search request in a minute on the other side, and I'll see that my estimated search results should have been about 297 for the. This is useful because if you're going to build up the navigation page that says next, 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 or page one, two, three, four, five, you need to know how many page links to put in there and when to, when to stop showing the next link. It's estimated because in internet-based search, it was OK to provide customers with estimated number of search results. And the indexer runs much faster if you don't need to, if you build up, you know, if you, the way the indexer works, or the, uh, the, the search engine works, it builds up, it, it finds the most relevant search results first, and it finds less relevant search results later on. And so we can give you, an est we can give you that first page back really quick as long as we say here's an estimate number of counts. We haven't gone through and found every single result. The FI tag, this shows that filtering did occur. If this FI tag does not show up in there, then we didn't do filtering. For directory crowding, direct, there was no directory crowding that occurred and there was no uh, duplicate snippets found. But if there was, then you might have to process, you'll process this XML and build the navigation for the additional links in there. Number of results, uh, here's the RN, here's the, or the R tag, and it's a result number one. And here's its URL, here's its encoded URL, here's its decoded URL, here's its title tag. And looking on down, uh, here's result number two, URL, title. Uh, here's the relevance ranking. So this is not very useful for external use. It's just a, re it's just a relative ranking of where the results showed up in the list. It's more for internal use than anything else. Here's the MT tag for meta tags associated with the result. There's the snippet. Here's the language of the document that was determined by the search engine. Now, dynamic navigation has some additional processing. When we send back dynamic navigation results, we include them in this tag called PARM for parametric. Uh, let's see, we've got PMT. Here's the name of the category, department. That's what you give it as there's a display name. There's a name of the meta tag field that was looked up. And if it's a range-based search, or if it's a range-based value, let's see if we have any range, here's ranges here. So if the, if the data is in integer and in the range of it, then we'll also give you the, uh, the range values. Let's see, integer range 1, T1, and then it goes on down. So this is the first, so there's a, C, there's a floor that gets added automatically from zero, uh, from 0 to 1. And there were zero, there were zero counts. That's the count parameter. There were zero counts in it. Uh, here's the low value in the range, the high value in the range, and the number of the count. So one to two. There were three hits. So you can recon from this XML, you can reconstruct the interface for this on your own application. There's also a ceiling that gets automatically added, five or more. There were results, so that ceiling value showed up. And it just means five to on into, if the high value is not shown, that's the ceiling. The count was three. Other features that will have additional XML sections in them include key matches, one boxes, related queries, people search, and user added results. So just a note, if you're using any of these features, plan for additional processing. I don't think the people, I think the one here that you want to watch out for is people search. This is probably where it's going to be a little tricky. There's probably going to be a little bit, there's going to be a little bit more work possibly involved here. Okay. These other ones are very straightforward. They're simpler than the, even simpler than dynamic navigation. You can also add custom search parameters that can be used by the XSLT pros, uh, processor. So if you want to modify your XSLT style sheet and you want to do some additional processing, like you'd like to check if this search, uh, if the search user is a customer, 
maybe you'd like to give them a different navigation page or a different XSL, you know, do a different XSLT processing on it. You can specify uh, the value of the search user. So over here, when I run a search request, I can add an additional search term, like maybe search user equals customer. When I run that search request, what happened? Well, nothing different because th this parameter got sent over the GSA. The GSA passed it through the XSLT processor, passed it through the XML generator, passed through, through the XSLT processor, and then returned it. The only place we see a difference now is if we take away the proxy style sheet, we'll see it as one of those parameters in the search URL. So let's go and find the proxy style sheet, remove it. And here it is. Search user, values customer. So it got passed through the whole processing pipeline. You can use it in XSLT. It, it's, it's sometimes good. It's, uh, people like to add metadata a lot of times to ad additional metadata based on who the user is or what their, you know, what their search criteria is, maybe uh, how they got to the portal. And you can reference this, you know, because this is XML, it'll be available when the XSLT processor runs. So if you, you write your XSLT style sheet, you look up for this parameter name search user and get its value, and then you can do additional, you could add additional page search criteria in there.